I'm so thrilled to introduce our panelists today for Art for Change, Climate Education, Activism, and Adaptation. We have Darian Deshawn, who is an actor, writer, and musician, and the Senior Advisor for Performing Arts at the Climate Museum in New York. We have Vanessa Peretta joining us. She is a teaching artist, a theater artist and community builder, and the Education and Community Director at the Big Green Theater at the Bushwick Star. And finally, we have Dr. Hoifei Mok, a scientist, artist, and community organizer who leads sustainability planning um, and sustainability initiatives for the city of San Leandro in California. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off first to Vanessa. We're going to go um, in order of age of the artists, uh, not of the panelists. Thank you so much for having me. I am Vanessa Peretta, she, her, Ea. Uh, I'm coming from you from Lenape Hoking Territory, the unceded land of Lenape, also known as Brooklyn, New York. Um, <laughs> I am uh, the Education and Community Director at the Bushwick Star. I am also, uh, as mentioned, a multidisciplinary uh, theater artist, uh, an activist, community builder, and generally just very excited to be here along this amazing panel uh, with Darian and Dr. Faye Mock and Kale. thank you all. Um, I am so excited to talk, to talk to you today about Big Green Theater, the Bushwick Stars, one of the Bushwick Stars' biggest education um, program. I'm going to be sharing my screen, so give me just a moment. I'm going to keep talking as I share some pictures because, uh, you know, visuals are fun, right? <laughs> so give me just a moment while I do that. But Big Green Theater is um, now in its 11th year here in um, Brooklyn, New York. Let's see, here we go. And it was originally uh, conceived by our co-founders, Noel Elaine and Sewell Kessler. And the program was developed and run in partnership with Jeremy Picard and Eco Theater Collective Superhero Clubhouse from 2010 to 2020. After that, we have are so excited to announce that as of 2020, Superhero Clubhouse has expanded and is taking Big Green Theater um, to other parts of the New York City region, as we will, the Bushwick Star, hold down uh, North Brooklyn, Bushwick Ridgewood. Um, so after um, this wonderful partnership, we are so excited to see Big Green Theater grow as we are an amazing after school program um, that is based in eco playwriting and theater building. Uh, we reach fourth and fifth graders in elementary schools in Bushwick and Ridgewood here in Brooklyn. Our kids write original, imaginative, and sometimes musical pieces that are inspired by environmental and climate justice. And our students work together with theater professionals to then bring their stories to life via the stage or now the digital stage of the Zoom platform. The goal of our program is to unleash and encourage our students' voices while providing them a space to learn about environmental justice, climate change, and ways that they can influence their community through activism and art. The issues of climate change and climate justice serve as the main problems and are inspiration jumping off points for Big Green Theater students to imagine uh, their personal worlds of um, solutions to all of our uh, big, questions about climate change. We work together in a lot of different modes. Uh, the first model that we ever had would take the program and do all of our educational uh, collaboration together in the school. And then the production would actually get pr um, produced at the Bushwick Star Theater in Brooklyn. And then we eventually evolved to a model that became more holistic in with each school in Bushwick. So the kids then um, got to not only participate in environmental uh, justice and playwriting workshops, but what made this model really unique is that it as it turned to production, all of our students get to choose a track. They could be a director, stage manager, an actor, or a designer to work on costumes, props, lighting, sound, um, and then work with professionals that are working in New York City to bring their stories to life. These are examples of some of our composers that we've been used, worked with over the years. And some examples of some current 
iterations that then happened as COVID happened. We were lucky enough to continue our programming and shift to a digital platform using Zoom. This is a little bit of that evolution of uh, being from the Bushwick Star and then moving over to our holistic model in school and then now to our Zoom model. I would love to share with you actually a couple minutes of an excerpt from PS75, Big Green Theater, their production this year, just to give you a little sample of what our kids are dreaming and creative, creating and working together. Here we go. So, excuse me. <laughs> You'll get it. Those were all good stories, but I'm not much of a story writer. Maybe I could do a song instead? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, yes, amazing. Awesome! We spoke about pollution, greenhouse gases, people throwing gas, and you know who gets affected by this? Big Green Theater, all of our practices are green. We've been so lucky that Big Green Theater has actually influenced the way that we work at the Star to continue to find ways to uh, cut down our carbon footprint and all of our production um, uh, design as much as we can, but especially in Big Green Theater. Uh, we invite you to please learn more about Big Green Theater. We are starting up at the end of September for our fall session. Meow, we're so excited. You can uh, follow us at the Bushwick Star on any platform. Um, but we are so excited to be here. And if anyone has questions, please, you can reach me at Vanessa at the Bushwick Star. I am so, I could talk about Big Green Theater all day for the rest of my life. So thank you so much for having me. And I can't wait to continue talking about all of this with our lovely panel. Thank you. Pass things over to Darren now. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you. I'm so happy to follow that. I got to say, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Zoom dance parties. So that was uh, that was great to great to watch. They look like they were having a lot of fun. Uh, so I'm Darian Deshawn. I'm an actor, writer, musician, and educator. Uh, my pronouns, uh, just my name, please. Darian, I'm here in Los Angeles, California. 
uh, also known as the City of Angels, also known as Chumash Territory of the Chumash people. Uh, I'm here with the Climate Museum where I am a senior advisor. And just to kind of break down what the Climate Museum is, it's um, Climate Museum is an organization that inspires action on the climate crisis with programming across the arts and sciences that deepens understanding, builds connections, and advances just solutions. Uh, the climate crisis is the defining challenge of our time, as we all know. Uh, so I joined uh, Climate Museum about three years ago uh, during their Climate Speaks Youth Program, which was a, it started off as a competition for a uh, poetry slam, where we had young people write poems on the climate crisis. But that slowly evolved into us dropping the, uh, the competition part and just having them build a community and fellowship uh, with one another. Uh, and I was brought on as kind of like a consultant and a host, and we did a big event at the uh, Apollo Theater. Uh, and from there, the program has continued to evolve, which I'll, which I'll get into uh, in, in a minute. But I did want to kind of show you, uh, really, I just want you guys to see the young people uh, in action. So I'm going to talk less and kind of show you <laughs> the young people uh, doing their thing, because that's, that's what it's all about. Um, so there was actually, when we were in the process of doing that first year in, in preparation for this uh, this big event that we were going to do at the Apollo Theater. Uh, we had the, the the great luck and great fortune to have uh, uh, some people from PBS to kind of uh, document the uh, the process. So what I thought I would do is I would show you guys a, a video of, uh, of the process and the young people and me working with them and, and kind of what we're, what we're about. So we can run that now if that's okay. Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll put it on the, uh, I'll put the, the link in the chat too, just in case there's any, if it feels uh, choppy or anything. You are dreaming, they sang as I swam on. You are dreaming, the bubbles whispered against my skin. Every mother dreams. You are dreaming, sobbed the slow, endless tide. I was born on a green eon. You are dreaming, you are dreaming. The earth blinks black, but the cosmos blinks back. Again, I want you to think about what order you guys would put that in as a group, right? I really liked like performance poetry for a long time. So I saw this as like an opportunity to get into something that I was interested in. And also like climate change is like a big problem. And like I knew that I needed to do something about it. And this was like perfect. And we need everybody on board because all the scientific data in the world does not match an evening like this when people can be moved and touched and feel what's really at stake. Dear greenhouse gas, I can't believe I thought I'd like you, that I fooled myself into thinking that I wasn't like you. The world will never be the same, call the crisis by its name, climate denial. All it takes to break those chains is mindful living and small steps that still make a difference. My poem is about how childhood and innocence was lost as the climate crisis grows larger. My poem is about how climate change really affects the youth and I drew from my personal experience with natural disasters. The other big note that I would give everybody is points of focus I think will help you. We all have a lot of beautiful, vivid imagery, right? And so when you have that, I would say make sure that you keep your image out there, right? When you're talking about what you're seeing or what you're describing, see it out there. It doesn't need to be internal. Sorry, little girl dreaming of octopi and jellyfish. Sorry, little sister. Sorry, we did not try to swim until we were drowning, and some of us not even then. Climate change? Well, that's just a theory. I scuff. If it's not real, why do I feel the symptoms of an incoming epidemic? The doctor said there was only a sliver of a chance that I could survive this, so they told me not to get my hopes up. I think that it's just really important to think before you act in general, 
um, and that solving any environmental issue isn't an easy task and it's important to really take some time to deeply think through the best solutions before you take action. So my poem essentially personifies Earth as a mother, like the common saying Mother Nature, and in this poem she's asking humans, her children, to come to terms with the damage they've wrought in the environment. One day, I'm going to have a daughter. I see myself holding my baby named Love, and I see her first breasts being contaminated with pollutants and chemicals. I see her first tears to signal her first breath, and they're coming out in streams of oil. Wildfires crackling, smoke darkening, children asphyxiated by a cloud of debris, no more movies. Even so, I am bartered, traded for a new factory here, a new mine there. I am affected when my relatives in Greece have to evacuate their homes just miles from raging wildfires spurned by climate change. Even when the weatherman said it would hurricane, I swept the tropical storm under the carpet category of mythological weather phenomenons. I have heard the screams of the young. They are breaking sound barriers, telling the people with power that their beautiful earth needs to be salvaged, that she is dying. But you are not there to mourn the mother's dreams set alight by factory fumes. But I told them that even though my cells have produced enormous amounts of carbon emission, waste, and lit my lungs on fire, I still believe they will one day redeem themselves and realize that my body is their home. And through their actions show they have come to understand that. I think like from this experience, uh, the youth is really concerned with climate change. And I think uh, it should be an issue that everyone is concerned about. I want people to see that things that they do have an impact and that it's a bigger problem than just themselves and that they really need to start doing something now because like the children are the only ones who are speaking up right now and they need to do something because they cause a problem. Once upon a time, I believed that the world was perfect. Right. Uh, so I'm a big I'm a big fan of raising the roof. Uh, so can everybody raise the roof for those awesome young people and got a chance to see uh, a glimpse of what they end up doing uh, on the Apollo stage, which was amazing and fantastic. That first year was uh, was a big one for us. Uh, and then the second year, obviously, we all got hit with the pandemic. So uh, the um, the organization we had to adapt like everyone else, um, as Vanessa was saying. And so what we did was we ended up doing an online component. Um, and the other thing that we did as an, uh, as, as an organization, we really wanted to, one, have the young people crystallize a little bit more. If you notice a lot of the, in that first year, we have a lot of like doom and gloom <laughs> kind of uh, uh, um, pieces. And so I think as an educator, we really tried to push and facilitate um, ways for the material to get us into a sense of call to action, stuff that felt motivating, not that they couldn't talk about kind of the hard truths, but also to uh, provide some degree of like hope, right? That's, <laughs> that's one of the things that I, I try to push as much as I can with, uh, with, uh, with the young people. And so I wanted to show you guys another clip of, uh, of our online performance that we did uh, last year. Uh, and this is a uh, uh, awesome, young person named Manav who did, uh, uh, well, well, Manav will explain it, but uh, yeah, just check it out. We'll, we'll go from there. Manav. My name is Manav and the piece I'll be performing is Ignorance Ignites in the Voice of a Wildfire. I was born from ignorance. I was born from oxygen. I was born from humanity's inability to adapt and change. While I provided warmth and comfort, left unchecked, I am all consuming. Natural disaster and signified beauty, my sovereign body is left ever to fester in its undignified fate. When I am born, I am infectious, but the vaccine remains elusive, spreading my raging heat upon my neighbors, forcing them to join my wrath. Irrepressibly contagious, climbing from tree to tree, the ashes I've created fill the air with despair, leaving behind my indelible stench. For miles and miles, acres and acres, I devour whatever is in sight. My myriad of reds, oranges, and yellows span across the landscape, 
reflected in the eyes of so-called humanity. Those blinded by my light cannot deny my crackling. The beautiful landscape that once was now consumed by my rage. Houses, memories, keepsakes charred from my indignation. The beautiful sky that once was with its hints of blue and its mosaic of clouds now permeated by my amber hues. Light consumed by darkness, hope consumed by despair, laughter consumed by tears, life consumed by death, humanity consumed by ignorance. Ignorance ignites. Factories keep burning, fossil fuels keep combusting, trees keep falling, humans keep consuming, suffocating the planet, suffocating our mother. They blame me for the destruction, but as they keep on burning, so do I. The cure lies within their hands. All they have to do is act, enact carbon mitigation policies, protect the flora and fauna, educate the public around the facts, around the science, but they have yet to do so. Their ignorance is my fuel igniting my flame in action. From that, I was born again. Thank you. All right, all right, everybody raise the roof. Ramana, raise the roof, raise the roof, raise the roof. Uh, and so we, we talked a lot about how that was a huge kind of step for everybody to adapt to this online forum. In some ways it was scarier than, than doing the stuff at the Apollo, right? Um, and so we're really proud that the young people had really met the moment uh, uh, of, of doing it at home and, and, and being able to really present it to, uh, to, to everybody. Uh, the last thing I wanna leave you guys with is, uh, so with our third iteration, again, this is an evolving, um, uh, evolving program. So with our, our, our third year, what we end up doing is we end up having two tracks where we had an advocacy track uh, and an arts track. And for the first half, we were uh, together, but then we broke off and kind of um, did our own thing where um, obviously the advocacy track worked more on advocacy and the arts track worked a little bit more uh, on the arts. But uh, during that time that I had with them, uh, I wanted to really stress this um, in terms of what is the role of the uh, uh, of the artists and what is the role of the activists. Um, and one thing that I, I presented to them uh, was this notion uh, of something called the political grid. Uh, can we show that uh, that presentation there? Is that okay? Or I can share it if that's, if that's easier. I can put it up if, if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. Here we go. Awesome. There it is. Yep. So uh, I read a book called uh, Rebuild the Dream by uh, Van Jones. And in, in, in particular, there's a chapter in there called uh, 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 about the political grid. You can go to the next slide there, which basically says that there are kind of four panels uh, that need to be activated for a successful movement, right? So you have the inside game, which is where the politicians are. You have the outside game, which is where the activists are. You have the heart space, which is where the artists are. And then you have the head space, which is where uh, a lot of the manifestos and the legislation, the intellectual stuff kind of comes from. And so Van Jones is basically saying that in order for a successful movement to happen, you need all of those panels activated at once. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So for example, if we look at something like the abolitionist movement, right, where you have somebody like uh, Abraham Lincoln, you have a Frederick Douglass on the outside game, you have like a Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, on the heart space, and then you have something like the Emancipation Proclamation, right? All four of those are activated, things happen, progress is made, right? Or if you look at, go to the next slide there, the civil rights movement where you have um, either a Lyndon Johnson or a John F. Kennedy in the inside game, you have a Martin Luther King on the outside game, uh, on the uh, outside game or the heart space, you have like a Harry Belafonte and a Mahalia Jackson. Uh, and then um, in the head space, we have something like the civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement. And so you can go to the next slide there. And so what I wanted to stress to the young people was that, uh, that there has to be coalitions made, right? Um, and that we are in an, an, an interesting time where all four of those things can be activated in a way um, that uh, we just, we have an opportunity here and that we need to really seize on, seize on that opportunity. And lastly, I think we just, I just wanted to end with uh, the Nina Simone quote. Um, 
Oh, sorry. Two more things. <laughs> uh, so what I always tell them is like, as an artist, like, what is your role? And, and, and knowing that we occupy uh, the heart space, sometimes there's some crossover where we're activists, right? So we also occupy the outside game. Um, but ultimately what we're doing is what, what artists do is we appeal to people's emotions. We help shape public opinion. We further momentum. We build group morale. We inspire hope and courage. We educate and we motivate people uh, to act. So that is kind of the, the framework for what we um, for what we want these young leaders of the future uh, to, to, to excel to. And then lastly, I think is the Nina Simone quote. There we go, yeah. Which again, I, I shared with them just to kind of, um, just for them to have on the back burner of, of, of the, the type of art that they create, uh, which says, you know, uh, I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That to me is my duty. And at this cr crucial time in our lives when everything is so desperate, when everybody, and every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people, black and white, know this. That's why they're so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country or will not be molded and shaped at all anymore. So I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? Uh, so that's my time. Thank you guys so much. And I'm looking forward to uh, talking more about this. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, really great to follow two, two really great panelists. Um, as stated, my name is Jorge Mock. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. Um, I'm calling in from unceded uh, Karkin Ohlone territory up in the Bay Area. Um, and um, I have a couple of different pieces that I want to share um, wearing my different hats. Um, uh, I do um, art um, on the side as an individual practitioner. Um, I involve a lot of art and creativity in my community organizing, um, and I bring a lot of that storytelling as well into my policy work on the local government level. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so these are just kind of some of the examples of things that um, I've done, um, I guess, as an individual practitioner um, and also ways to kind of ground myself. Um, so the first um, image is uh, a mural that I painted in my um, office um, at the city, um, kind of just really trying to remind myself that the, the work that I do um, as a public servant uh, really needs to be heart uh, grounded, um, that um, I am beholden to, to the community and that the community knows best um, what, what we need to do in order to move forward, in order to, to kind of form the policies that, that we need in, uh, to meet everybody's needs. And just kind of a reminder also that um, the community includes the earth and like having all the pollinators and, um, you know, plants around there is just a, that, that we are in relationship uh, with the land um, as we move forward. Um, so that's the, um, the first mural. Um, the second image um, is uh, a public um, installation I did actually with the city before I started working there um, around the idea of, of bees, again, the, the pollinators and um, what will happen if they disappear. Um, so if you can't quite read the, 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 um, the text, it's a little bit cut off, it says, uh, you'll, you'll miss me when I'm gone. Um, the back side of it says, because we're in this sun all together. And again, just kind of tying in the, the theme of community, um, being in relationship with the land and um, thinking about how we're interconnected um, in this. Um, and the last uh, image is, is a mural that I did um, with one of the resilience hubs, uh, which very quickly, um, is an idea that um, any kind of community center or community space can really be a, um, a way to provide resources and um, leverage the existing relationships they might have to community members and so on, um, both during a crisis um, and also during a recovery uh, from a disaster. And so uh, one of the local resilience hubs that I work with, both in professional capacity and also as a community organizer, um, is the Disability Justice uh, Culture Club. So they particularly um, serve the disability um, community um, here in the Bay Area. Um, and one of their founders, um, the late and, and really beloved uh, Stacey Park Milburn, um, asked me to do a mural around the idea of mutual aid and, and solidarity. And really, I'm um, thinking about how uh, mutual aid is really going to be important in this time of the climate crisis and that really knowing that we are each other's um, you know, safety net. Um, and, and I was inspired uh, during that time because it was the um, Australian uh, wildfires last year. And there was a story about um, some wombats that, um, or, or rather that um, 
animals were surviving the wildfires because of the use of the wombat uh, tunnels, um, underground tunnels. And it's not that the wombats, you know, intentionally dug those tunnels uh, for the other creatures, but that that was kind of an act of, you know, um, mutual aid in, in a way where people were able to kind of leverage what was already existing, the resources that were already existing. Um, so that was kind of a whimsical um, interpretation of, of that um, example from nature and uh, also just gives a little bit of um, hope uh, for, for these kind of times. Um, so that's the kind of work that I do as an individual practitioner, uh, just kind of working um, to provide images and, and so on and, and really thinking about the types of stories that we can uplift and examples from, uh, from nature and, and so on. Um, as a community organizer, um, I work in a lot of different spaces and uh, one of the spaces that, that I work in um, is APINC, which is a queer and trans um, uh, Asian Pacific Islander organization um, in the Bay Area. Um, and the one of the projects that we had um, was uh, uh, Q2POC um, Climate Stories. And really just, again, thinking about how um, oftentimes the climate movement can be very white-centered. and wanted to have a space for kind of like culturally appropriate to, appropriate and um, just being able to uplift the stories from our homelands. Um, so we had a creative writing and haiku party um, facilitated by a number of different um, creative writing um, experts um, in, in the Bay Area and we had a really lovely gathering where folks were able to kind of write um, haikus, um, you know, just kind of thinking about reflecting you know, like how the climate impact, uh, how the climate crisis has, has impacted them and really um, using a uh, art form that is really like, you know, culturally, um, you know, appropriate and, and you know, comes, comes from our, our backgrounds and so on. So uh, these are just some of the examples that, um, that were pulled uh, from that particular workshop. Um, we were part of um, the Equal Justice uh, League um, as part of that organization is really just our um, climate justice working group and it really is a uh, multi-generational uh, working group of people um, as young as new college all the way up to um, over 50. So it really is a way to kind of um, cross-pollinate, you know, exchange ideas and so on. And one of the major themes that comes up uh, really is uh, storytelling, uh, being able to share from our cultural backgrounds um, and kind of using um, art as a way to um, just kind of hold space for each other and so on, but particularly because um, a lot of the folks there, um, they're not um, technical experts like, like I am, but they're really just kind of like, you know, trying to deal with the brunt of what the um, climate crisis has, has, you know, brought us all. Um, so one of the projects that we're doing right now is a seed exchange where we're all growing seeds together and thinking about resilience, um, and then also tying in um, stories from the homeland about, you know, the different seeds and uh, what different types of medicinal uses that they might have and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the community organizing um, aspect and, and um, I take a lot of those lessons um, as I go into my, my policy work. Um, so very briefly there, um, I do a lot of work around the Climate Action Plan, uh, doing a lot of community driven planning and so on, and also working with, with youth. Um, so just uh, this particular summer I'm working with um, a group of youth uh, from local high schools. Um, again, thinking about um, the, the storytelling and, and things that they can do. So using the um, um, story of me, story of us, and story of now, um, kind of public narrative training that um, all other groups like Sunrise Movement and, and other um, you know, organizers have, have done, um, kind of teaching that framework um, to the youth to be able to have them uh, create their own stories about how the climate crisis has impacted them and then being able to kind of leverage those videos, you know, as a public servant to be able to, um, you know, launch some sort of like marketing or behavior change uh, campaign from there and really, you know, think about, okay, like as young people who, who are going to be impacted the worst um, from climate change, like what is your call to action to the rest of us? And then, you know, thinking about that as a campaign. Um, so I'll kind of pause there and, and let us go on to um, the, the panel for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to shuffle us around a little bit on screen. 
Um, and while I'm doing that, try to ask the first question. Um, I think, you know, these examples are just incredibly powerful. There's, there are sort of no words to describe how this lands, you know, in all of these different cases. Um, so maybe I'd like to start us in a little bit more of an analytical place. I'm curious, how do you think, you know, art creates footholds for engagement in the climate crisis and in climate action? Um, and how did each of these experiences build new narratives about climate? Um, maybe you can start. I think um, particularly as um, a public um, policymaker and so on, um, we're often thinking about, especially in the government space, just like um, the abstractness of the climate, you know, crisis. Like we're often talking about emissions, and you know, it's just the like, what what exactly is a metric ton of carbon dioxide? Like, I don't know. Like you can't measure it. I can't see it. Um, so it's very removed from what people's experiences are. And I think that um, when you're particularly when you're even thinking about the personal story or like um, all the different modes of, of art that we, we just saw in this very short, you know, 30 minutes, um, it's really tapping at like, how does it impact us? How is it actually, you know, hitting us in the day to day? And I think that that um, allows people to have a little bit more of a realistic grasp of like, okay, this is actually something that I need to be thinking about because it's impacting me and it's impacting my family and, 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 and friends and so on, rather than something that's like, super scientific and technical and, you know, it's happening like 10 years from now or whatever. Uh. Yeah, piggybacking on that a little bit, um, using the idea of, uh, or going off of the idea that, um, especially through the arts, and I'm very talking specifically uh, with the younger um, age group that I work with, that using um, more than just like a unit in a class, right, to talk about a big topic like environmental justice, climate justice. And when you plant the seed beyond like a unit in a school and then move on that it, um, and create your narrative, create storytelling, create opportunities of dreaming, it then kind of trickles down in the community. So by starting with our youth, you know, it goes then to their siblings, to their family, and then consequently to their friends. So I feel like specifically um, with my with my demographic that by being able to engage in in especially like elementary schools in a time beyond <laughs> a month um, to really dig into how this impacts our youth and also taps into their solutions is the way that is really impactful we've seen just kind of be a ripple effect yeah I know on our end we <clears throat> we really have a uh stressed uh, steering away from this notion of, well, I'm just an individual and really leaning more towards, uh, really leaning towards this notion of collective action, uh, that you guys are stronger together. And so we, we, we stress that whatever they're doing, it's like th the whole point is that stay as a unit, stay uh, as a group. And the other thing that I think that we have crystallized throughout the, the, the last three years are uh, really uh, centering our target <laughs> because I think there's been a lot of like, well, we need to recycle. And, and so in more, recent, in more recent times, we've been more focused on the fossil fuel industry, right? And making sure that the young people understand that, listen, this is where a lot of the carbon emissions is coming from, from the fossil fuel industry. So let's really <laughs> hone our artwork towards uh, what's really kind of the large mammoth and, and, and what we can do collectively together to, to, to take that on. And I know that's even been crystallized for me, you know, just even working at the, 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 um, the organization, you realize like, oh, this is really where we need to, to spend our energy and there's something that we can, we can do about it together, collectively. Yeah, I think that's you know, such an important point and that I, I've been grappling with too, like this idea of individual action, collective action, but then also, you know, pointing, understanding where responsibilities lie beyond 
Like, is it enough if we all change our daily lives or are there much larger structural shifts that are beyond maybe our power as individuals? So, you know, on that note, how for the three of you as artists working with community members, with students, has that work actually shifted your own perspective on climate action or on climate adaptation? That's a really great question. I'm excited by that. Um, one of the things that I think I've learned through this work is that this is actually a, a marathon. You know, I think it's really easy, especially through the arts, because we're talking about the heart space. <laughs> um, it's really, I think it's easier for artists to get really activated and on fire and just be like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have this firm stance and, and operate in this way. But then that's exhausting. And we know that like, A, we're stronger together. I know that for me personally through this work, I've learned a lot about small movements. Consistent small movements are actually more healthy in terms of the reality of, of the, the journey we have to go together. Um, and that's been really informative and also reinforced through the youth too, to slow down, to be okay with incremental, even though we're talking about like, what is the difference in the impact right now, I'm finding that for our youth to be able to not give in to the gloom and doom and to hold on to resilience and hope and solution based uh, dreaming that slow and steady, really pacing ourselves through through collective, you know, um, action is uh, has been really impactful. And, and a big it continues to be a big, um, you know, piece of continual education as an artist and as a, um, as a teaching artist as well. Yeah, um, I, 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 I resonate a lot with that answer. And um, I think that whenever I get um, really down or overwhelmed by um, those feelings, um, it is really helpful for me to kind of um, get grounded in, in community and like the, to remember kind of those different um, actions that we've done together and how we've showed up for each other. Um, there's a lot of examples of mutual aid and solidarity here in the Bay Area. Um, and I think that um, art particularly, um, this might go into another question that was come up later, but um, a couple years ago when the fire started happening here in the Bay Area, um, I started holding uh, climate grief sessions and it just really reminded me of like how important it is to kind of acknowledge the emotional impact um, that, you know, this work has, um, particularly as professionals, I think like working in, in this space um, because, of, you know, I'm not just like looking at it on the, on the private end, but like also, you know, on, on my, you know, paid work as well. Um, so, so I think like, um, having um, just ways to work through the, the grief or like the depression or, um, you know, all the other emotions that come up allow me then to, to, to arrive at that hope for the resilience um, that I need to kind of move forward. Um, and, and art is really a good way, at least for us, you know, as an individual, and I think also for young people as well to kind of like process um, all of those things. Yeah, I, and just to, to go back, yeah, I think for, for me too, just thinking about the last year and a half and how, uh, how great it was to see the young people and for us to be pushing forward uh, together. Um, and, you know, as an educator, because you also have to find uh, the hope and the silver lining. And so for us to be doing that together, I think is what, uh, what made the last year and a half uh, bearable, meaning that at least we're all here uh, in this Zoom room together uh, because we believe that uh, there's things that we can we can do and that we can that together we can we can change the world. And so I think that was was incredibly helpful. Um, and I also think too that particularly when ta tackling um, you know the climate crisis, what I've learned is. Uh, just the way the, the the education keeps getting more and more uh, defined in terms of the fact that you know that that climate change disproportionately affects 
people of color, uh, the disabled, the elderly. Uh, I think these are all things, these are lang this is language that I don't think we were particularly using before. And also too, guiding the young people towards steering away from this notion of kind of eco-fascism. You notice in that first, in that first year, there's a lot of, and the voice of mother earth and beware of my wrath. And, <laughs> and now we're kind of going, well, wait a minute, you know, some of, uh, if we, if we truly believe that, then we'll see that some, some of those places are, are, are disproportionately affecting people of color. So is that, is that really what we want to be saying? Um, and so I, that being said, I think that the conversation is getting, is getting more nuanced, which is, a, which is a good thing, I think, for all of us. Yeah, it's something that, you know, I know when we were speaking a little bit earlier, um, Vanessa and Faye, you both brought up the role of emotions in different ways. So I think maybe we've touched on the aspects of climate grief in some way, but Vanessa, I know you'd said before, you know, what are some tangible moments of joy and hope that have emerged from this work? So I wanna add one, maybe a second question in there if we can, which is in addition to those tangible moments of joy and hope, um, what role do you see the arts playing in the future of the climate movement? I'll go first with a tangible moment. Um, I think one of my favorite parts in being like rooted in a community that has a program like Big Green Theater, um, I've been lucky to see a lot of students move through and grow up and still be in Bushwick or Ridgewood. Um, and I had a moment this past year where a student, I saw a student and when we work with them, they're in fourth or fifth grade. Now they're in high school and talking about environmental justice and talking about it as if it's actually not a big thing that because they started talking about it when they were in fourth grade, that it became something like a normal part of the vocabulary. And then something that they then felt comfortable talking with their family about. And then consequently, even though they weren't necessarily going in the arts, they still did it because they found a voice there. And I think that's really inspiring that the, the idea of if we can start speaking about solutions, start speaking about the realities, as we've said, of, of like who is really affected by climate change and, and what tangible action looks like in terms of moving towards environmental justice, that once it becomes a part of your vernacular, actually it takes away the fear and like the scope or like what can very can seem like such a big, heavy topic to, to deal with that it just becomes seamless and like, yeah, I'm gonna keep working on this and we've got this. And I think that hope like <laughs> can't be replaced for, for me personally. Uh, that's one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, hope is is really critical um, to this work. Um, and I the kind of, as I mentioned before, um, I think that the community organizing, just like kind of drawing examples from the community is really um, key for me in terms of, um, um, yeah, kind of just keeping an eye on like where, where I'm moving towards and, and so on. And um, there there's a couple of examples that, um, or, or sayings, I should say, um, that always come to mind. Uh, one is that hope is a discipline and just like kind of being really, really um, consistent. And it's not that hope is like this, like optimistic um, thing that happens. It's not a good feeling. It's just that, you know, the kind of determination that you have to just keep going. Um, and yeah, that it's a, 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 a thing of a radical act to kind of be hopeful. Um, and, and I think that, um, at least in terms of uh, art and, and creative work, um, particularly when I'm, I'm thinking about storytelling, um, it's really helpful to be thinking about um, um, ancestor work and, and particularly like indigenous work, where we're thinking about uh, folks seven generations before and then some generations um, forward uh, to know that this work isn't just like us and right now and that we have to solve everything. Right now, but that it's an ongoing um, kind of thing, as Vanessa was saying, um, and that there, there's always work to be done, but that 
there is kind of a future to, to look forward to. Um, and that people have gone through these types of changes before and have found ways to adapt and, and move forward. Um, so I think that particularly working with all the different communities and like um, those, the stories that they tell um, is really key for me um, in terms of the, the hope um, and yeah, what keeps me going. And I've forgotten your second question, so maybe we'll come back. <laughs> Yeah, I know as an educator, just in terms of when I was kind of facilitating the sessions, I, I would always make sure that I was able to create moments of joy by doing a lot of just silly group games and raising the roof. And one of, one of my favorite ones is uh, uh, find something crazy on top of your head in five seconds. So you do that in five, four, and then we pick a winner on that. And so uh, and that would always get that always, you know, that would always put a smile on the, the young people's faces. So it's, it's being able to kind of create, I think, mo moments of joy uh, in the midst of kind of doing some of this uh, more heavy, uh, uh, tackling this kind of heavy uh, subject matter. So I, I, I try to find some balance with that, that we can still find joy together. Um, um, so yeah, and then I would say, just going back to what I said about the, again, the political grid, as I, I always stress that it's, it's about recognizing as artists that we we occupy uh the heart space and i was very candid with the young people about how there was a, a lot of years where i was wondering like why isn't in my me and my contemporaries why isn't our art changing the world what are we doing wrong <laughs> and i had to have that understanding of like oh, okay there's only so much space that that the artist takes but it's an important space uh in terms of the way it shapes public opinion the way it boosts uh group morale um, and so that, that is in conjunction with other things that are happening and that we need to make sure that we are, are building coalitions with, uh, with those other panels um, and, and, and trust that the, the work that we're doing uh, will, will, will help folks. Thank you. I feel like we could spend the rest of the afternoon, but I'm forced to remark that it's, we have five minutes till the hour. So I just want to give you each another minute if you have, you know, a further thought or something we haven't touched on. And then I'll say a few more words about Kale as we bid farewell to each other. I think I just want to jump in and, and, and say thank you to Kale and just any type of opportunity where we can come together and talk about the work in different different areas and different arenas, also different parts of the country is really helpful. Any um, anytime like I can see other professionals like really thriving and engaging, um, it is just as hopeful, but also like just as um, I think refilling as we know, like a, a lot of uh, this work, not only as an artist, but as a facilitator and then like somebody as we all are like a presence in the community, um, it's a lot. It's a it's a labor of love. It, it's heart space for a reason, and and um, and you know we. I think there aren't enough opportunities where we really can come together and just talk. Really, just talk about how we're feeling, what we're we seeing in the community, the impact, and and how that's kind of playing out both like emotionally <laughs> and through policy making in our respective communities. Um, usually, we'll find arenas that are very academic or take. Um, just approaches that aren't necessarily speaking to everybody's senses or necessarily inviting a wide scope of people to the conversation. So thank you for continuing to provide these outlets because I know that now I wanna be able to reach out to everyone here, everyone on this chat, like genuinely all of you participants, like now we're all here, we're all here for a reason. So please feel free to reach out to, to me. I will take note of who's in here as well, but like thank you for providing the space to just really have conversation. Um, I think it's just as important as the work. Yeah, it's all the levels of communication. It's like, how are we communicating about climate change? How are we communicating with each other? How can we make space to have discussions that we don't expect um, or we don't often have? Darian or Faye, any parting words? Yeah, I just, and just to piggyback on that, I think you're right. Like finding solidarity is 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 crucial. Um, and I just wanted to, and also to to recognize that uh, 
that there's work to be done. Uh, so it's not just about talking, right? It's also about doing. It's also uh, about action. So, you know, in whatever way that you can, I always encourage people to uh, to get involved in, in, in whatever form that you can. If that means, uh, you know, um, protesting or putting stuff on your social media or uh, donating money, uh, or all of the above, which I which I try to do. I think it's 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 imperative that uh, that we're all doing something. Uh, and I just put some some links on there if you want to learn a little bit more about the Comet Museum. And there's a uh, a campaign that they're doing right now that they just launched about three days ago called Beyond Beyond Lies, which really kind of tackles it's a public uh, uh, um, art piece that is tackling uh, kind of the disinformation campaign of uh, of the fossil fuel industry. So so check that out. And thank you guys for thanks for for this opportunity and this platform. It's been great talking with you all and, and seeing you guys all. Yeah, not much else to add. I think uh, Darren and, and uh, Vanessa kind of covered it. Um, and yeah, just thank you again for this opportunity. And I think it's really important that we not discount the arts um, when we're doing this work um, in policy and doing otherwise, um, because it is yeah, as Darren was saying, like the heart space is one of the really critical way that we got change. Um, so hopefully we'll see more uplifting of that. Thank you. Darian, Vanessa, Faye, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I know Emily dropped the link in earlier, but we have a jam board. So I know we had some questions that might not have made their way into our discussion, but if you feel like leaving a note um, or a thought or just some exclam exclamation points in our uh, kale jam board, it will be open and we can kind of continue the discussion virtually on the way out the door. Um, I'm not gonna put up slides again, but we have more kale programming happening in October and December and what we're gonna continue with this uh, thematic year and look forward to seeing you all again. I know a lot of people are not new to kale at this point, um, and we love to have both newcomers and returning community members to keep this conversation going um, here within our group as well. So thank you all. I'm thrilled to have been able to get us all in one place virtually, at least for the hour. Take care and uh, reach out if you have questions for the panelists, if you have questions for Kale, you wanna get more involved in planning sessions. We're here, we're talking and uh, see you all soon.